Who are those two harpies standing over there like the kiss of death? Made from your own foot, I have no doubt. Now, Miss Stanley, if there will be no more interruptions, I have a few small matters to take up with you. Since this corner druggist at my arm, at my elbow, tells me that I shall be confined to this moldy mortuary for another ten days, due entirely to your stupidity and negligence, I shall like to carry on my activities as best I can. Therefore, I shall require the exclusive use of this room, as well as that drowsy sewer which is called the library. I want no one to get in or out while I'm in this room. What do you mean, sir? We have to go up the stairs to get to our rooms, Mr. Weston. Right. Isn't there a back entrance? Why, yes, sir. Then yes. use that. I shall also require a room for my secretary, Miss Cutler. Uh, let's see. I shall have a great many incoming and outgoing calls, so please do not use the telephone. I sleep until noon and must have quiet throughout the house until that hour. <clears throat> Will you take your clammy hand off my chair? You have the touch of a sex star cobra. Now, will you all please leave quietly? Or must I ask my secretary to have someone here with a baseball bat? Well, goodbye, baby. We'll call you. Um, um, we'll see you. Goodbye. Now, look here, Mr. White. There is nothing to discuss, sir. Considering the damage I have suffered at your hands, I am asking for very little. Good day. I'll call you from the phone later, please. Not from this telephone, please. <clears throat> Here is the menu for lunch. But I've already ordered lunch. It will be sent up to you on the tray. I am using the dining room for my guests. Uh, where is the cook? And where are those cigarettes? Why, my son went for them. I don't know what he... Here, Sarah, here is the menu for lunch. I'll have mine upstairs on here. Young lady, I cannot stand indecision. Will you either go up those stairs or come down them? Oh, hello, Mr. Whiteside. Here are those cigarettes that you asked for. I'm sorry that it took me so long. I had to go to three different stores. You were gone long enough to have a baby. Oh, There's not a man in the world who suffers as I do from the gross inadequacies of the human race. Where are you all to now, Miss Bedfan? Why don't you go in and read the life of Florence Nightingale? Learn how unfit you are for your chosen profession. <clears throat> well, I think I can safely leave you in Miss Cutler's capable hands. Shall I check it again this afternoon? If you do, I shall spit right in your eye. Ah, what a sense of humor you young writers have. By the way, it isn't really worth mentioning, but I've been doing a little writing myself about my medical experiences. I'd be spared nothing. Would it be too much to ask you to glance over it while you're here? Right. Well, I just happen to have a copy with me. The story of a hollow practitioner, or 40 years in Ohio doctor. I shall, uh, trump everyone. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope you like it. Well, see you in the morrow. Keep that here quiet, and don't forget those little pills. Goodbye. Oh! Maggie, will you take 40 years below the navel of whatever it's called? Well, I must say, you certainly behave with all of your custom grace and charm. Look here, puss. I have no mood to discuss my behavior, good or bad. I have no desire to cross this cheerless threshold. I was hounded and battered into it. I now find myself, after two weeks of racking pain, accused of behaving without charm. But what would you have me do? Kiss them? Very well, Sherry. After ten years, I should have known better than to try and do anything about your manners. But when I give up this job, I may write a book about it all. Through the years, the Prince Charming... Listen, Repulsive. You are tied to me with an umbilical cord made of piano wire. Now, if we may dismiss the subject of my charm, for which, incidentally, I have paid $1,500 per appearance, possibly we can go to work. Oh, no, we can't, yes. My name is Harriet Stanley. And I know you were Sheridan Whiteside. Saw this holly framed green against the pine tree. I remember what you heard about Tess and Julia Skewer. It was the nicest present I could bring. God sake, what was that? <laughs> that was Mr. Stanley's sister, Harriet. I've talked for a few times. She is quite strange. Strange? She's right up with the hound of Baskerville. You know what? I've seen that face before somewhere. Nonsense, you couldn't have. Oh well. Here, press this little doctor's book, will you? I see no reason why I should endorse maiden form procedures. Uh, here are some telegrams. Uh, what date is this? Uh, December 10th. Ah, um, send a wire to Columbia Broadcasting. <coughs>
You can schedule my New Year's Eve broadcast from the New York studio, as I shall be returning east and setting, uh, instead of heading out to Hollywood from there. So, four special New Year's Eve broadcasts will have as my guests Yasha Heifetz, Skia Pirelli, The Lutz, and Dr. Alexis Carell with Haley Selassie on shortwave from England, or Whiteside. Are you sure you'll be all right by Christmas, Sherry? Of course I will. Uh, send a wire to Mahatma Gandhi, Bombay, India. Dear Boo Boo, schedule change. Can you meet me in Calcutta July 12th at dinner 8.30, Whiteside? Mm. Oh, wire to the editor of the Atlantic Monthly. Dear Sticky, copy will arrive, Whiteside. Mm. Arturo Tuscany, oh, where is he? I'll find him. Very well. Counting on you, January 4th, Metropolitan Opera House, my annual benefit. Home for paroled convicts. As you know, this is a very worthy cause and close to my heart. Tibbet, Redbird, Martinelli, and Flagstaff have all promised me personally to appear. Will you have quiet supper with I and Ethel Barrymore afterwards? Or Whiteside? If that's for Mrs. Stanley, tell me she's too drunk to talk. Hello. What? Hollywood? Oh, if it's cold, then hang up. Oh, hello, Banjo! Banjo? Give me that phone! Banjo, you old so-and-so. How are you, darling? I miss you. Come on, give me the phone! In fact, he's screaming at me oh, now. Oh, really? Here he is. How are you, you fawns behind? And what are you giving me for Christmas? Ha 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 news, Banjo, my boy. How's the picture coming? How about Wacko and Sloppo? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm fine. No, I've got the best horse doctor in town. <laughs> uh, what about you? Having any fun? Playing any cribbage? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, save a little for me. Don't take all of his money. <laughs> you you what? Having your portrait painted? By whom? Milk Gross? Not really. No. From here I go to uh, New York for the Drama Festival. And I'll be there ten days, and then I go from there to Dartmouth. You wouldn't understand. Well, I must have spent all my time talking to Hollywood riffraff. Uh, kiss Lavella Parsons for me. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, he took $1,400 from Sam Goldman and Cribbage last night, and Sam said, Banjo, I will never play garbage with you again. Let's all just about having his portrait painted. Mmm, Salvador Dali. That's all that face of his knee. It's a surrealist painted. What do you want now, Miss Bedman? It's a Thomas. One every 45 minutes. Now, where were we? There's a cablegram here from that dear friend of yours, Lorraine Sheldon. Let me see it. Sherry, I've been in Scotland on a shooting party with Lord and Lady Connor, and have only just heard about your poor sweet him. I'm down here in Surrey with Lord Bottomley, sailing Wednesday on the Normandy and cannot wait to see my poor sweet Sherry. Your blossom girl, Lorraine. In the words of the master, I may vomit. Come, come, puss. Mustn't be bitter because she's more beautiful than you are. Great Sheldon is a very fair example of the small but vicious circle you were. Your sex jealousy, if I ever saw it. Uh, bring me the rest of those. Great Sheldon, or the father, my aunt Fanny. Ah! It's from Destiny's Top! Oh, he goes a little over, boy. Mm -hmm. Listen, dear baby's breath, what is, that, what is this I hear about your hip fracture in some hotel brawl? Uh, does this mean that our Hollywood Christmas party is off? Uh, finish the new play in Pago Pago, and it's superb. Myself and the lady leave Honolulu tomorrow in that order. Uh, by the way, the Sultan of Zanzibar wants to meet Ginger Rogers. Let's face it, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> he does travel, doesn't he? You know, it would be nice if the book went around Beverly Carlton for a change. Hollywood next week? Why couldn't he stop over on his way to New York? Uh, send him a cablegram, will you? 
Beverly Carlton, Royal Hawaiian Hotel, Honolulu. These people intend to have their friends using the front door. Do you expect them to use the rope ladder? I will not have a lot of mildew pussbacks rushing in and out of this house while I'm... Oh, good morning, Mr. Jefferson. Good morning, Joanne. Uh, go away. There's nobody home. The Stanley's have been arrested for uh, white slavery. <laughs> good morning, Miss Whiteside. I'm Jefferson of the Masalia Journal. Get rid of him. I'm sorry, Mr. Whiteside, is even know what you say. Oh, really? <laughs> Mr. Whiteside seems to be sitting up and taking notice. I'm afraid he's not taking notice of the Masalia Journal. Will you please excuse us? Good day. You know, if I'm to be insulted, I'd rather it be by Mr. Whiteside himself. I never did like carbon copies. Mmm, touche if I ever heard of one. And then Masalia too, Maggie dear. Oh, will you please leave? How about an interview, Mr. Whiteside? I never give them. Go away! Mr. Whiteside, if I don't get this interview, I lose my job. That's quite all right with me. Now, you don't mean that, Mr. Whiteside. You used to be a newspaper man yourself. I know exactly what editors are like. Well, mine's the toughest one that's ever lived. You won't get around me that way. If you don't like them, then get off the paper. But I happen to think it's a good paper. William L. White would have got out of it for you, but he didn't. You have the effrontery in my presence to compare yourself to William Allen White. Only in the sense that White stated it for you, and I want to stay here and say what I want to say. Such as what? Well, I can't put it in towards Mr. Whiteside and sound like an awful lot of cooey, but it was my father's paper. It's kind of a sentimental point of paper. I'd like to carry on where he left off. Ah, so you own the paper, eh? That's right. So this editor, this dread journalistic apocalypse, is you, yourself? In a word, yes. Ah, I see. In the future, Sherry, let me know when you don't want to talk to people. I'll usher them right in. Come here, my boy. Uh, I suppose you've written that novel? No, I've written that play. Well, I don't want to read it. Ah, do these old eyes spy lots of goodies over there? Hand it to me, will you? The trouble is, Mr. Whiteside, that you being in this town comes under a heading of news. Practically the biggest news since the Depression. So I've just got a good story. Ah, a con butternut fudge. Oh my, you mustn't eat candy, Mr. Whiteside. It's very bad for you. My great aunt Jennifer ate a whole box of candy her entire life. She lived to be a hundred and two, and when she had been dead three days, she looked better than you do now. <laughs> now, what were you saying, old fellow, that you were about to say? I can at least report to my readers that chivalry is not yet dead. We won't discuss it. Well, now that you've won me with your pretty ways, what is it you would like to know? What about a brief talk on famous murders? You're an authority on murder as a fine art. My boy, when I talk about murder, I get paid for it. For God's sake, I made more money at the Snyder Gray case than the lawyers did, so don't expect me to give it for nothing. Um, what do you think of Vesalia? How long are you going to be here? Where are you going? Things like that. Very well. Hey. Masalia is a town of irresistible charm. B. I cannot wait to get out of here. And C. From here I go to Crockfield for my semi-annual visit, and then from there to New York. Uh, tell me, Jefferson, have you ever been to Crockfield? No, I haven't, but I always meant to. As a newspaper man, you ought to go there instead of wasting your time here with me. It's only about 75 miles from here. Tell me, have you ever heard about how Crockfield started? No, I didn't. Sit down, Jefferson. Oh, take this with you. It is one of the most endearing and touching stories of our generation. One misty St. Valentine's Eve, the year was 1901. A little old lady who had given her name to an era, Victoria, lay dying in Windsor Castle. Maud Adams had not yet caused every young heart to swell as she tripped across the stage as Peter Pan. Irving Berlin had not yet wrote the first note to a ragtime tune that was to set the nation's feet a tapping. And the last week, Crockfield was just emerging from the state penitentiary. Embittered, destitute, cruel of heart, he wandered on this St. Valentine's Eve into a little church. There was no godliness in his heart that night. No, no prayer upon his lips. With callous fingers, he ripped open a, this poignant testimony of a simple people's faith. Greenly, he clutched a few pitcher points within. But then, a child's wavering treble broke the twilight stillness. 
Please, Mr. Man, said a little girl's voice, won't you be my valentine? Elias B. Crockett Hill turned. There stood before him a bewitching little creature, no more than five, her yellow curls cascading over her shoulder like a, a golden Niagara. In her tiny outstretched hand, a humble valentine. In that single crystal moment, a sealed door opened in the heart of Elias B. Crockfield, and an idea was born. Twenty-five years later, three thousand ruddy cheek convicts were gambling on the broad lawns of Crockfield's home, basking in the cool depths of its swimming pool, broadcasting with their own symphony orchestra on their own radio station. Elias B. Crockfield has long since gone to his maker, but the little girl of the Golden Girls, now grown to lovely womanhood, is now known as the Angel of Crockfield, for she is the wife of the warden. <laughs> and in the ivy-covered walls of Crockfield, in between a Rembrandt and an El Greco, hangs in a simple little frame a humble valentine. And in the men's washroom, every Christmas Eve, the ghost of Eliza Crockfield appears in one of the booths. Will you sign this, please? This agent debutante, Mr. Jefferson, I retain only my employee because she is the sole support of our two-headed brother. <laughs> I understand. Thank you, Miss Whiteside. You've been very kind. By the way, I'm a cribbage player at the over in Town. <laughs> Fine. How much can you afford to lose? I usually win. We won't discuss it. Uh, come back at 8.30. We'll play three-handed with Elsie Dinsmore. <laughs> Jerry! Metz! Metz, you incredible beetle hound! What are you doing here? I explained, Sherry. First, I kissed by little Maggie. Uh, and Starling, what a wonderful surprise. Jefferson, you are standing in the presence of Professor Adolf Metz, the world's foremost authority on insect life. How do you do? How do you do? Well, Sherry. Oh, Metz, stop looking at me adorably and tell me why you're here. You're sick, Sherry. So. I come to cheer you. Jefferson, he lived in a cave for two years with, with nothing but flat ice. He read three pages in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Don't you, my little hookworm? Please, Sherry, you embarrass me. Look, I bring you a present to while away the ice. Please. I say to my students, boys and girls, I want to give a present to my sick friend, Sheridan Whiteside. So, you know what we did? We built for you a community of America. The America. Totally known as the American Cockroach. Ah, behold, Sherry, Rose City. <laughs> Inside are 10,000 cockroaches. 10,000? Sarah, Sarah, what do you think? And in one week, Sherry, if all goes well, there'll be 50,000. If all goes well? Oh, what can go wrong? They're in there, aren't they? Wait, please. You can watch them, Sherry, as they live out their whole lives. Look, here is their maternity hospital. It is fascinating. Oh, they well. have pet movies, too. Please, Maggie, these are my cockroaches! <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Chance. With these earphones, Sherry, you can listen to the main phone. There are microphones down inside. Listen. <laughs> well, how long has this been going on? <laughs> Aha! They're the American Americana! There are cockroaches in this house! I beg your pardon! Mr. Whiteside, I don't know who this man is, but I will not stand here! And hey, go upstairs! Oh, uh, that must be Mr. Baker. Uh, come right in, Mr. Baker! Jefferson, these men are the fruits of that humble Valentine. Gentlemen, I envy you your great adventure. You're Michelson, aren't you? But you're Sean Yes, sir. Ah, how do I write? This one there is uh, Henderson, the hatchet fiend. Always chop him up in a salad bowl, remember? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Lunch is ready, Mr. Whiteside. Oh, uh, good. Let's go right in. Go right ahead, gentlemen. Uh, Max, you'll stay for the day, of course. Certainly. Jefferson, stay for lunch? Glad to. Oh, uh, very well. Let's go. Uh, may I help you? Oh, thank you. Uh, we're having chicken liver stetrazzini and cherries jubilee. I hope every little tummy has a flutter with gastric juices. Uh, Joanne. Close the door, will you? I don't want a lot of people prying on their betters. <laughs>